G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, continuing this off-season series of going through each individual AFL team and uh, giving them a bit of an analysis, I guess, a bit of a breakdown, look at how 23 went, having a look at their off-season, their best 22, and projecting a little bit about how 2024 might go. If you're unaware, I have been doing this series for a couple of weeks now, I think, and I've been doing it in reverse alphabetical order, which means I started with the Western Bulldogs, and I've moved all the way up now to the Essendon Football Club. Yesterday on the channel, I would have done uh, Geelong and Fremantle as well. So if you want to find all of these uh, profiles of different teams in a one single place, there's a playlist on this channel uh, called Air Team Based Videos for 2024. So you can find all of it in the same spot and you can have a bit of a binge if that's your sort of thing. So today we're going to talk about the Essendon Football Club, a team that has been starved of some real success for a little while now, as the memes say. Uh, but in today's video, we're gonna take a look at exactly where their 22 sits uh, and, and some depth options, particularly in the wake of a very, very proactive uh, trade period and, and off season and, and draft as well. They were proactive again at the draft, trying very, very hard to improve this list in the short term. And therefore, they're quite an intriguing team to talk, sort of forecast for 2024 and beyond. So before I get into it, if you could do me a favor, if you're enjoying the content, if you could consider subscribing to the channel, we do both footy and cricket content here on this channel. And I'm trying to get to 25K by the start of the new year. And I'm, and I'm kind of a little bit below where I need to be uh, because as we get into the off season, it's starting to slow down. But anyway, you don't have to, but if you are enjoying the content, um, I would appreciate it. So let's start talking about the Essendon Football Club in terms of how 2023 went. Uh, again, of a very Jekyll and Hyde season from a team that historically has been pretty Jekyll and Hyde. At various points during 2023, they looked like a team that could definitely play finals. And then there were times throughout, particularly the back end of the season, they looked like a, a little bit of a basket case. Not for long periods of time, just isolated examples where they just looked really, really poor. And there was a far cry from their best form. I mean, their best form saw them beat Melbourne. I think in round 17 as well, they had just beaten Adelaide, who was a uh, what was a pretty strong opponent, I would say. And they sat fifth on the ladder at round 17. From that point, they would only win two more games for the rest of the season. They beat North Melbourne. They beat the Eagles by a point. And in this little downturn of patch of form, they lost to the Giants by 21 goals a team that wasn't that much higher on the ladder at the time, and then finally going down to the Premiers in the final round of the season by 12 goals. So Essendon needed to pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and try to aggressively improve this list, uh, and that is exactly what they did. So it's interesting to decide what angle to, to sort of try and analyze Essendon at, because they did improve by four wins this year. Uh, they had a pretty poor 2022. In 2021, they did make finals though, which I think kind of gets forgotten a little bit because their form has been so up and down. But rather than focus on the negatives, um, you know, we'll consider some positives that came out of 2023. Uh, in particular, I think Kyle Langford kicking 50 goals as a new makeshift undersized key forward. Not really undersized, but he's kind of like a medium rather than a true key forward, but 51 goals. I think that put him in the AA squad um, and justifiably so. And another really strongly performed individual this year was Zach Merritt, um, as he so often is. But I think on the whole, you know, some of their best performances this year, they did look pretty good and it does kind of give an indication that they might be on the right track. They had a pretty aggressive off season. I think I count 11 list changes there. So we'll start with uh, the players that left the club. It is Tip and Woody, obviously retired. Dirk Thatcher made his way to Port Adelaide. D'Ambrosio went to Hawthorne. Andrew Phillips retired. Then there was some cuts of Will Snelling, James Stewart, Patrick Voss, Anthony Mankara, Rhett Montgomery, and Kian McBride. Oh, looks like there was a 12th, Alistair Lord. I <laughs> forgot to scroll down there. Uh, but in terms of list additions, this was obviously uh, one of the, they were probably the most proactive team this offseason, getting in four players uh, that could potentially be maybe not all in their best 22, but probably in their best 25. And that's Ben Mackay through free agency, Xavier Dersma as part of that Dirk Thatcher deal, Jade Gresham joined through free agency from St Kilda, Todd Goldstein was also as a free agent from North Melbourne on a one year deal. Uh, and then in the draft, they traded up to get Nate Caddy, a highly rated young key forward prospect. Then they added a couple of running defenders in Luwaman Luwal and Archie Roberts, who both of those selections were quite good value, I thought. I thought Luwal is a good prospect for pick 33 or whatever it was they got him at. And Archie Roberts slid into the 50s. Further to that, they did rookie list a young rock prospect as well in Vigo Vicentini, which kind of makes sense given that Goldstein is just on a one-year deal. So now I'm going to have a crack at their best 22. This wasn't overly simple. I did find it a bit challenging uh, because there's a few things that are a little bit up in the air, uh, but this is what I've got. And I've erred on the side of conservatism once again. So uh, the players in yellow are the new players. The only one, new recruit that I didn't put into this best 22 is Todd Goldstein, but we'll get to that. So we'll start with the back line there. Ben McKay comes in as their legitimate 200 centimeter key defender. 
Now, as a back three, that's the that's the three I settled on in, in Mackay, Ridley, and Laverde. I think that's probably how they start round one. I do think that Laverde in particular there might not be overly safe. When you consider the Dons actually have a pretty good list of developing key defenders there, or at least certainly players that probably project as more true key position height. And there's, there's Zach Reed in there who's obviously been injury riddled as a key back prospect there. He's a former top 10 pick. Like, does he start round one? I'm not sure. You'd probably have to drop Laverde for him. I wouldn't drop Ridley. Uh, then there's also Lewis Hayes who they drafted a couple of years back and, and someone like Kane Baldwin as well who I think plays both forward and back but might be uh, forecast as a key back option there. So on the plus side, there's some depth there. I'm just not exactly sure if that back three that I've picked there stays the same throughout the year. But nonetheless, they do get their, their tall stopper there in Ben Mackay. Uh, as for the medium types, you know, Redmond and McGrath are probably pretty, oh, they're definitely safe. I think they're both good running defensive types. Dyson Heppel, again, as an experienced, uh, you know, former captain, I th- I've got him starting in this team. But again, I think he could be vulnerable uh, to some other types. I've also left out Jake Kelly. Uh, I put Nick Cox on the bench there. I like that because... First of all, we don't really still know exactly what role he's going to play at AFL level, or at least outsiders don't. Essendon fans probably do. Uh, but, you know, 200 centimetres, he's played as a wingman before. He's a little bit skinny and raw to play as a key defender, but he is versatile, and he's good at ground level. So as a you know bench option there in the, as a defender, coming back from you know a long history of injuries, that's probably where I start him. But the other options in the back line are, like I said, Jake Kelly. I mean, Nick Hine can play at half back there. Uh, and then the two recruits in Luwama and Lawal and Archie Roberts, what they both bring is a bit of rebound and speed. And that's what contrasts them to someone like a Dyson Heppel. So if Essendon at any point feel like this team isn't getting enough speed out of the back half, Dyson Heppel could be vulnerable there. Let's talk about the midfield there. Um, you know, it, the top end is strong. Zach Merritt is an absolute bona fide star. Um, Darcy Parrish has flirted with being a star and at times just been a decent player. Uh, but either way, you know, I think that's a solid mix there. And I've picked Caldwell as an on-baller. It'll be interesting to see if he can make the ascension to being a like a proper legitimate midfielder as opposed to just a forward mid. Um, and then Dersmer and Martin are on the wings. Nick Martin has, has become a, a fantastic wingman. And what I like about those two wingmen is that they're pretty suited to those wing roles. Sometimes when you put it together, these 22s, there's a temptation to pick on ballers on a wing, um, which I don't think is necessarily ideal. But Nick Martin in particular is a gun wingman. So there's a good balance there. And then the bench option, uh, well, Sam Durham is another wingman there. And Ben Hobbs as well, who I think has showed pretty strong linear improvement for a young first round mid prospect. I think uh, he's a long-term player there. And I would pick him in this team, absolutely. I don't think there's too much doubt about that. We'll move to the forwards. I actually like this forward line. I've gone with the three talls of Wright, Langford, and Stringer. Now, Langford and Stringer are in probably not true key position, but I'm going to call them talls for the purposes of this anyway. Peter Wright is a legitimate tall. He's a you know ruckman height, obviously. So Peter Wright, probably the second ruck in this in this list, but I think all three of those players are capable of kicking 50 goals in a season, definitely. And, you know, serve the purposes of being good in the air on the lead and stuff like that as well. So that's probably the forward three I would go with. But, you know, there's some bench options there. I mean, I, I, know, I see some fans want Harry Jones into this side, but he has missed a lot of football. I think he played five games last year. Sam Wiedemann is far from being a sure thing. I was very tempted to put Nate Caddy in this team because I think he's relatively ready-made. Um, but as a key forward prospect, he'll need time in it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, with Stringer, Langford and Wright, I, I think Shoehorn and Caddy in here might have been a bit tricky, but I would like to see it in an ideal world. I've picked Menzi as their legitimate small forward there, Gresham as well as a uh, half forward, uh, and Perkins still on the forward flank. Perkins obviously has the potential to become a bit more of a midfielder, similar to Caldwell there. We got a couple of rotating mid forwards. I'd like to see him play as a midfielder, but we'll see what happens there. He had a bit of a point of difference there. I suppose the only thing with this forward line, with Guelphi on the bench there, is in terms of the smalls, none of them are huge, hugely productive when it comes to kicking goals. None of them are goal machines. I think Menzi is still young, and uh, you'd expect his output to increase, so there's that. Uh, and Gresham, it's probably been since like 17, 18, where he was kicking 30-odd goals a season. His goal output has dropped. So, I mean, that's nitpicking, but I do think this forward line is good. It just so happens that Essendon aren't a strong side for generating inside 50s. I think they were bottom four in the, in the comp in 2023 for generating inside 50s but if they can find a way to get the ball inside 50 and feed this forward line I think it is a genuine strength there I also put Elijah Sardis as my sub I really really want to see him uh, get some games this year I think he's obviously missed with injury played five last year and I think the upside and the the long-term payoff of getting games into Sardis 
means that he should start round one, which means I did leave Dylan Shield out of the side, which may or may not be controversial. I mean, we have to factor in as well, he's, he's had a bit of an injury interrupted preseason. Maybe he starts outside in the VFL. Um, we'll see. But this was the mix that I went for, and I would like to see this from an SNM point of view. Other midfield bench options, uh, well, there's Will Satterfield as well, who's, um, you know, a decent depth player at this stage, but I think that would start with this particular mix. And Goldstein and Nick Bryan as the rucks outside of the team. So overall, I do think that's a pretty balanced and sound best 22. I mean, it helps that they recruited you know, three established players to slot into this team. Um, you'd expect to see an improved 22. I think where the, the fortunes in the short to medium term lie is just players who are kind of on the cusp of breaking out, r- reaching their potential. You know, I mean, Andrew McGrath's one who we, as a former number one pick, does he have another gear to go to at this stage? What is he, 25? But some other talents that I would say are fairly high potential. I think Jai Caldwell, um, even if it is a primarily as a forward, I think he can be dangerous. Archie Perkins is obviously potentially an explosive forward mid. Um, the, the development and, and progression of these guys to the next level. I mean, Elijah Sardis, Ben Hobbs are a little bit younger than that. But another one is Xavier Dersmer as well, who you know has flirted with his best foot form at Port Adelaide. Him coming in and establishing himself as a, a legitimate best 22 player, I think is really important for Essendon in the short to medium term. And that's exciting. It, it just means that there's a lot of question marks over the exactly how far Essendon can improve next year, but it does help that they've got some players sort of about to enter their prime. It's a good position to be in. So in terms of like evaluating their ongoing needs, I just sort of have a look at like what uh, the clubs could look to add to their list to improve it. I, I don't see any obvious flaws with this team. I mean, um, I, I'm sure I pointed out, you know, the, the, th- the three tolls down back is, is far from settled. They might go for more true key position players, both forward and back, to be honest. Uh, but they do actually have, you know, a list of developing tolls in, in either side of the ground there. You know, there's a, there's a developing top 10 pick as a key back. There's a developing top 10 tick pick as a key forward in Caddy and Reed. There's depth there. Then there's competition. Um, so they're not, there's not a particular massive list gap that I think they need to cover up immediately. They've got young developing midfield talent. Hobbs, Sardis and Perkins are still obviously reaching that potential still. I think the smalls are pretty good. Though, like I did say, maybe some like genuine forward line potency from the smalls that they do have forward. I'd say in terms of their like the immediate finals hopes and um, you know challenging for the four potentially obviously that's what they want to strive for the midfield is good but it probably still lacks that top end quality obviously Zach Merritt is, is top end quality absolutely but you know Parrish regaining his absolute best form to to support him there and but I think they're going to need one of Caldwell Perkins Hobbs and Sardis to really find uh, an, a way to rise to the top if that makes sense I feel like I'm not wording things right in this video, but they do have the high-end potential, I think. Particularly Sardis, he's probably my pick out of that group. I think their medium to long-term fortunes do kind of ride on some of these guys, in particular Sardis, maybe even Hobbs, to find that top level and become a really A-grade midfielder because of that. at the moment, the midfield there isn't quite premiership standard, which I realize is not groundbreaking. So to forecast 2024 for this Essendon side, it's, it's tricky. It is tricky. Uh, I do see top eight potential. You know, when you map out that 22, there is balance there. There's no obvious list gaps. There's enough top end potential. It's just a case of kind of waiting for them to really click as a team because the, the difference between their best and their worst is pretty severe. That being said, we have to remember as well, they have a new coach. Uh, well, that was Brad Scott's first year as coach, right? And it is not unheard of for coaches in their first year to produce results like that. I mean, I do feel like that issue has plagued Essendon for a little bit longer, but factoring in you know, what Brad Scott could potentially achieve in his second season, a more mature list. A lot of the, the lists that Essendon have here are players either in their prime or about to reach their prime. And a distinct lack of veterans, actually. Other than, you know, Shield and Heppel, um, both of those guys will be borderline best 22 this year, I think. Um, and Todd Goldstein, I didn't pick in the 22 either. But a high portion of their list in their prime or about to hit their prime puts them in a really good position and gives, a, I think Brad's got a really good foundation to try and build the next premiership team for this group. By the same token, there's probably some urgency to try and perform now. I mean, I think Essendon no longer have the excuse of being a rebuilding young side. I think the time to improve is, has come, uh, but I do think they're also in a good position because they have invested for the future there with a lot of investment in high draft picks since 2020 when you consider uh, Ben Hobbs, Nate Caddy, Elijah Sardis, Perkins, Cox, and Reed. I think all of those guys went top 10. Forgive me, Ben Hobbs went pick 13, but that's one exception. So purely from a list profile, analytical point of view, I think their, their list is in good shape. Um, obviously, they need to unearth some real top end talent, whether that's be through trade in a few years or just waiting for the talent that they have to rise to the top. 
Either way, I think they're in a good spot, and I think Brad Scott has enough to work with there to really improve this team to eventually win a final for a start um, and then potentially go further. But anyway, guys, that is just my take on the Essendon Football Club. They will be uh, an interesting one to watch for sure. And I, to be honest, I find myself rooting for them a little bit. It's been a while for Essendon. Their fans have gone through a lot, to be fair. Um, so hopefully Brad Scott can make a click this year and uh, maybe it's just because my Eagles are so terrible that I'm finding it in my heart to be empathetic to other fans and you know if the Eagles were competitive this year I'd probably want everyone else to fail but you know finding it in my heart to, to want other fans to have a good time this year while, while West Coast stink it up but anyway I hope that was a coherent video I am feeling a little tired today um, but either way let me know in the comments what I got right and what I got wrong your own best 22 if you're an Essendon fan or not um, and I look forward to hearing from you in the comments but for now I'll say goodbye and I'll see you in the next one cheers